frames from the model and focusing on the velocity field here. Excuse me for a second, I gotta check what velocity we are using. Um, we are using this is the surface velocity. Okay, so we're back to the same model, the slice of neck offs. Um, let me move this over here for a second so it's not distracting. And what we're seeing here is the surface uh, velocity vectors. I put a scale vector up here that says 25 centimeters per second. Um, and that's roughly the velocity uh, of the surface um, surface in the bay. See what I've just realized is I'm rendering two different things, but they're approximately the same for this case. So we'll look at it. Um, the white vectors are the surface velocity. Um, the sh rendering is actually the magnitude of the vertically average velocity. Um, but they're approximately the same. There isn't significant vertical shear in this case. Um, so we can look at the magnitudes in the sense of that. So we're seeing, um, and I'm not rendering the very, very fast vectors of Woods Hole and Vineyard Sound because it tends to clutter the whole diagram. So I essentially truncated. Um, I'm not rendering any vectors that are going faster than say 50 centimeters per second. Same with up here in Cape Cod Canal. But at least we can see from the rendering where the high energy or high tidal energy areas are, Vineyard Sound, the holes, Quicks Hole and um, up here, uh, the Cape Cod Canal, we just, which we just see a piece of um, here. Um, so I'll go through the, the frame. This actually will start with uh, zero o'clock, whatever that is, uh, and we'll go through the day. Now this is not a typical day. Well, it's not. Uh, we have to remember this isn't only the tides. We're including the influence of the winds. The winds blowing from uh, the northeast. So. It's a, a northeast wind, so it's basically going from the upper part of the bay down along the bay. So it's a long bay wind um, pushing water, surface water, out of the bay. Um, and those winds are strong enough that essentially you'll see on the flood tide, they, they more or less cancel out. Um, they don't quite cancel out, but they, they reduce significantly the surface velocities coming into the bay because um, the, uh, the tides are pressure gradient from the tide is fighting the, the pressure gradient that's being set up by the wind. They're, they're basically opposed, the forces are opposing each other, tide and wind, um, on the flood tide. So you'll see tremendous asymmetry between flood and ebb. Um, so the wind's driving the tides and that's a, a sort of an average pressure gradient which we'll see more clearly in the next video where I'm going to remove the effects of the tides. Um, so right now let's focus on the tidal influence. I'm going to bring in here find what I did with it. Here, nope. Sorry. Okay. Hmm. Here. Point. Okay. I don't know where it disappeared to, but these are traces in time. So zero hours is midnight of uh, the day we went out, or the morning of the day we went out zero. Here we are out between eight and noon, something like this. So this shows t elevation at two points. So let's pick those two points. Um, I can't remember which color is which. So let me go, I'll pick the first point, say near where the lucky lady went out. Uh, which graph is that influencing? I can't tell. Red, black. That is influencing the black line. So that's where the lucky lady went out is the black line. Um, that is the tidal elevation in meters over the course of the day. You can see the second high tide was larger than the first high tide. Um, it's not a very smooth line again because we're only sampling this every hour. We're only saving the data every hour. High tide occurred around 5 a.m. That's correct. And low tide was between 10 and 11 sometime um, on the day on uh, September 30 uh, when we were out in the water um, and the second high tide. And the second line, I'm going to put another probe in. Um, let's put it actually into Vineyard Sound over here. I'm putting it in the middle of Vineyard Sound. Um, and so I want to contrast for you uh, these two tidal signals, which are quite close together in space uh, relative you know, to the scale of the Earth. So we're talking 15 kilometers apart, but two quite different systems. There's a very large difference in the amplitude of between the larger, relatively larger Buzzards Bay amplitude and the smaller uh, vineyard sound amplitude, um, and that plays a strong role in driving these 
high velocity currents to these holes. Essentially these are little mini hydraulic systems uh, where you have significant well you have some significant difference in elevation across them. The canal is the same thing because Cape Cod Bay and Buzzards Bay are very different tidal systems um, which lead to strong velocities in the Cape Cod Canal. Um, and there is there are some differences in phase too and we can look at these if we look at some model results uh, of the amplitude and phase. I'll open these. Um, this is the amplitude of the M2 component. So this is the twice a day component. It's a dominant component in our region. Um, and you can see how it varies uh, spatially. So, um, so there's a twice a day tide. It has a period of 12, 12 and a half hours roughly. And in Buzzards Bay has relatively weak tidal heights. Again, um, you know, you're talking uh, uh, um, in the M2 component, about three quarters of a meter in amplitude. Um, Cape Cod Bay and Boston area and everything further north essentially along the, the New Hampshire and Maine coast have much, much larger tides. Anyone who's been to the bay has seen the, the influence of uh, the effect of a large tidal range combined with a very shallow sloping beach um, and you have various very intense tidal flats there. Um, an important thing here is you can see the, the difference between the, the Buzzards Bay tidal amplitude and the Vineyard uh, Sound amplitude. There's essentially a zero. There's a near zero amplitude line that runs right along here, um, uh, Mesquite, right across Muskegon, right across Nantucket Shoals, and you really have um, two tidal systems that are essentially colliding here. If you want to think about it loosely, one that's come in through the Gulf of Maine, and one that's come in across the New England Shelf, and they sort of combine out of phase, resulting in this. A node, that's not actually a node, resulting in this zero line of amplitude here. Um, so across which you have a big jump in phase, which is smoothed out a bit in this model result, um, but right across Muskegon the tidal change um, very rapidly. We'll see the phase difference in the next diagram, but essentially you can move about 15 kilometers and have difference in high tide times as much as four hours. That phase difference drives very strong velocities through Muskegon, very strong velocities in Vineyard Sound, in diagram over here you can see how strong the tidal currents are here. Of course these are two places that people have looked into in terms of harvesting the power of the tides along with Cape Cod Canal. Um, that's about it. So I mean when you hear on the news people reporting, actually let me go to the next slide. So there is a big difference in amplitude. Buzzards Bay, Vineyard Sound, amplitude differences, that's what drives the flow through these holes um, which makes for some navigation difficulties. I'll show you the phase. This is again just for the twice a day tide. This is phase in degrees. So think of some baseline as zero being in the New England shelf. Uh, that's zero degrees Greenwich. Um, and then we have phase delay, a, a, um, a lag coming up here. Uh, M2, in terms of M2, every degree is two minutes. Um, so 60 degrees is two hours of difference in high tide. Um, you can see the jump right here across, Mus across Muskegon going from roughly zero to something like uh, 240 minutes uh, just in this, this very small span of space. Same thing's happening in Vineyard Sound here. There isn't a very too strong a phase difference between Buzzards Bay and Vineyard Sound, but you can see it gets stronger as you move up along the Elizabeth Islands. The phase difference down here in Cuttyhunk is small, but the phase difference at Woods Hole is larger where you're getting to near this jump that's occurring in Vineyard Sound um, where you, again, you have roughly as you, as you go across West Chop is about a four hour, uh, or three or four hour difference in high tide. Most of Cape Cod Bay and Boston and everything are, are pretty fixed in time. This is a pretty unique feature. This is one of the reasons we have areas with very strong tidal currents, um, at least in Vineyard Sound and Muskegon and Nantucket Shoals, you have very strong tidal currents, even though the amplitude there is near zero. It's very small. Uh, most places in the world where you characterize high tidal currents uh, have either um, will have a, have a large amplitude associated with that. The coast of Maine, Bay of Fundy, um, Korea, you know, Northwest U.S., etc. Okay, so that's what I want to say about that. That's reflected in the model result that shows the actual time series. So you can see, you can imagine what the amplitude of this wave is. If I put a mean value here, it's a distance from the peak to that mean. That's, that's the amplitude of this uh, elevation here and the black line again is but reflective of Buzzards Bay and the red line is reflective of Vineyard Sound and the difference between them means the water is always um, you know at, at, at high tide it's higher in Buzzards Bay than Vineyard Sound so it tends to pour into Vineyard Sound 
Um, and at low tide in Buzzards Bay, it's lower than it is in Vineyard Sound. It tends to pour back into um, Buzzards Bay. Um, so let me go through just uh, click through frames here, and you can kind of see what's... Oh, I, should, I should have left that up. Um, let me put that back up. One second. Give me one second here. Okay. So we put it back up. I'm going to go through uh, frames. Where is my time floater? Pull that over here so I'm not staring off the, the left. Okay, so um, you'll see the surface currents react, and so they're reacting to two things right now. The pressure gradient that's developing because of the large-scale tides, uh, and the other is the wind. So this is the surface velocity is strongly influenced by the wind, and again, the wind's blowing from upper right to lower left. As we go through, the little red dots in this diagram indicate where we are in time in this frame in terms of the sea surface elevation at those two stations, Buzzards Bay and Vineyard Sound. As we march towards high tide at 5 a.m., um, we're reaching, uh, the tide is actually starting to turn around. So uh, Buzzards Bay is like a, is a standing wave system. Um, so there are different types of tidal waves. I'm not sure if we've discussed this yet or not, but we will eventually. It's, a stand, it's close to a standing wave. Um, so you'll see um, in most of the bay, the, the water getting near slack um, when you are at peak or, or um, at high tide or low tide. The peak velocities occur in between the high tide and low tide. Um, so as we go, now we're marching towards, on our way towards low tide, and you can see the velocities are peaking um, here. So this is probably peak ebb, what I would call ebb from Buzzards Bay, um, and the water is driving the same direction as the wind. So there's a pressure gradient where the, the water surface is tilted um, because of the tides and because of the wind, and those are mutually um, sort of constructive so that uh, you get a greater than um, tidal ebb velocity because the wind is working with the tides. And then we'll turn around. We've hit low tide. Now the water's starting to flood back into the bay, or it's about to start flooding back into the bay. The elevation's rising, the tides are turning, um, but you'll see that the flood tide is disorganized. It should be max right about here, and it's disorganized and weak, and that's because um, that the wind is opposing the tide. Um, the structure of the tide is not as simple in and out. You can see um, clearly the influence of the holes, which are actually a little bit out of phase of the whole thing. The influence of the holes keep this from being a very simple system. You can think of a box model, floods in, it floods out, uh, and the patterns are, are, are very much not like that. And we'll see that when we look at the residual flow. The influence that these holes have on the residual flow um, is significant. And also places like around West Island, you have a, you have a very strong acceleration um, of the tides, and, and so these sort of coastal features tend to, to generate um, large tidal currents as well. That's what I wanted to say about this. Um, yes, okay. So, so I will mention while we were out there, I guess, let's just have a look at that. So, is my boat moving? Yeah, my boat is moving, okay. So, 8 o'clock, then we left the dock. Uh, we left the dock, it was peak ebb. Um, and that peak ebb surface currents, um, we're getting near, you know, 25, 30. Uh, centimeters per second, um, which is not strong enough to want to go out and throw tidal turbines in the water, but it's it's something. Um, and as we headed out into the water, it was starting to uh, to to weaken a bit. We we're getting near low tide, so again, the strongest tide currents are occurring between flood and ebb. I'm sorry, between high and low tide and low and high tide. So between high and low, we're getting that strong ebb. Now we're at low tide, the tide's turning around, approaching slack, um, but it won't go slack exactly because of the wind, um, wind forcing until a little bit later. Um, so the wind is playing a very strong role in my description of the system as a standing wave, uh, is playing a strong role in the symmetry um, because the forcing is, is approximately as much as the tides, at least on the surface currents. Um, and then the, we reached our maximum station. It was still ebbing at the surface at that point, um, although it's flooding, we'll see at the bottom. And, um, and then we were back quite quickly. So let me pause this and start another one.